Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to day two of Next TV CEO Africa. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our speakers, moderators, and sponsors, namely DW, Harmonic, uh, Metrological, SES, Zatu, and BBC World News. Let's take a look at today's agenda. So shortly after uh, our brief introduction, uh, we will start the first panel on the television advertising in Africa, followed by a panel discussion on African content collaborating with uh, in international export platforms. Our sponsors at will have a, a small presentation on the benefits of a TV as a service platform. And finally, we will end the, the sixth edition of Next TV CEO Africa on a country focus on Nigeria. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming for our first panel, Michael from Star Times and Denis from the Coca-Cola Company and Lamray from Habas Africa, Nigeria, for our first panel discussion on television advertising in Africa. And our moderator for this insightful panel discussion is Lara. Lara, over to you. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Shauna. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, this morning, we're going to be discussing television advertising in Africa and I suppose the current state of, of play for television advertising in Africa in obviously very changing times. So um, what I'd like to, to do is start off with each of our, our panelists, Sean has introduced, but first I'd like them to maybe each just introduce themselves just briefly to tell us a bit about their role in this advertising ecosystem, because today we're fortunate to have three different perspectives. We've got Coca-Cola, which is the advertiser. We've got Havas Nigeria, which is the, the agency. And we've got Star Times, which is the, the broadcaster. So let's start with you, Lonre, from an agency perspective, maybe just introduce yourself and Havas Nigeria. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Um, it's great to be here. My name is Lonre. Ebola, and I'm the CEO for Avas uh, Africa, Nigeria. Uh, um, we have us uh, one of the Landre, we're struggling to hear you. Yeah. Sorry, Landre, we're, we're really struggling to hear you. I think uh, we're um, uh, get the best. Yeah, I think we've lost Landre there. Let me move on to, to Michael from Star Times. So you just introduce yourself and a bit about Star Times. Well, uh, so my name is Mike, uh, Mike Mwai Mogo from Kenya. Uh, I've been working for Star Times for I think the past eight years. Um, what I do here is uh, content, uh, content marketing and content, and, and the content director as well. Um, and this is what we do. A lot of what we do is really, ad is really advise clients on, um, you know, sports that, you know, how to give maximum value to anything that they would like to, to promote. Because over time, we've, we've realized that um, one of the things that Star Times has is a two-way system that usually gives us data, you know, real-time data on what customer needs and you know, what customers are watching over time. And so one of the things that now I primarily do is also sit down, with, you know, advertisers and give them info that you know helps them or guides them uh, better on uh, the decision making process in terms of media buying as well and we also extend the same same benefit to um you know advertisers advertising agencies and stuff like that it, it makes life much much easier for everybody so it becomes more targeted so to speak danny maybe i think we all know uh, what coca-cola is but maybe you can just tell us about your role <laughs> Yeah, uh, so yeah, it's great to meet everybody. I'm Danny. I look after uh, Shred, Sony, 
Spalletta, uh, Crest, uh, Palms, and Hawaii, and a couple of other ones that I forget sometimes across Africa. So what I basically do is I am the category lead. Um, my job is to obviously grow the brand, but also grow them with a, a specific consumer-centric mindset. Um, and that's obviously how we've all been stuck in this room to figure out how we land media we go together going forward. Okay, great. So then I wanted to, 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 to ask both of you to kind of set the stage for us. Um, obviously, we all know that there's been massive changes in the in disruptions in the market for the, the past few years. But specifically in terms of, of an African market, um, what really is the, the situation? What is the biggest change? I mean, we do live in a continent where the vast majority of people still don't have access to many of these disruptive platforms. So in terms of advertising, obviously it's it's going to be very different for different markets. Um, your more urban or uh, affluent markets that have access and the money for streaming and all of that is, you know, is obviously very very different to your mass market still. Where I would and I imagine Coca Cola, for instance, plays in both those spaces. So what really has changed, um, and how do you adapt to now having to speak so differently to different markets, whereas before they were perhaps in one place. Yeah. Maybe just give you a perspective on that, and Danny. Sure. Um, I think in the in the bigger scheme of things, nothing really has changed. I think uh, media is still media, and the channels you use are the channels you use. What's changed, though, is um, what you what you deem as effective at this point in, in the new normal. Um, I think for us as Coca Cola, how we look at it is we look at a couple of things. We look we don't just look at reach and engagement. We look at what is going to help us drive recruitment for the overall business. Uh, and we use, we use that as a starting point, I think. How we've approached it is, okay, let's look at what optimal plans mean. And optimal plans will obviously have uh, all your different channels across them. Uh, and then it goes down to, well, what is best for us in terms of spend versus what we're trying to do within a specific market. Um, you know, I, I have a, I can give an example of Kenya, for instance, where we're looking at uh, Schweppes and we're looking at what is what are, what are we trying to do in the long run? We know that TV is expensive, so, so we know radio is expensive actually more than TV. So what do we what do we do then? Because radio has obviously got the mass reach and TV isn't as big. So there's trade offs we have to make in terms of okay, well maybe we don't choose. We don't choose radio when we figure out what we do below the line to amplify what we're doing, uh, you know, on TV. So there's a lot of trade-offs, I think, that are happening. I think the, the biggest thing, though, is what are you trying to achieve as a, as a business um, and, more importantly, as a brand? For us, we're clear, is how do we get more people drinking more of our products? Um, and that, I guess, is the mindset we use when we start to speak to media agencies is, but this is what our creative looks like. Uh, is it a aligned to us getting uh, more consumers, um, or you know, increasing our penetration, whatever the, the the drive or the focus is within a specific country, and then we take the conversation from there. And in terms of what we we call traditional TV, um, obviously, as you say, it's 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 got pros and cons. But in 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 which markets, perhaps, is it still your dominant? Um, or, or not maybe dominant, but in which market is it still, you know, playing a really important role? I think it's always going to play a role. Um, you know, across across Africa, the, the first thing we do is, is look at TV. South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, um, Uganda, Egypt, uh, Morocco TV is, is still prominent. But again, it goes back to uh, how are we best using, uh, you know, the limited investments that we do have, uh, you know, as a company, but more importantly, for us, it's where's the best experience. I think we've we've shifted from just doing, you know, just allowing yourself to say, well, because there's there's five million people watching a specific spot at a specific time, that's the great spot for us. It's what is the experience we are providing, and do we have the content that matches, uh, you know, whatever, you know, however many people there are at a specific time now within. Uh, any any channel, so traditional traditional TV for us will will never disappear. I think across all markets, it's still very big. It's it's again, it's it's trade offs in terms of what are you trying to do from a, an overall business perspective, and is the you know is the brand right for it for Shreve, for instance. Um, one of the things we we have spoken about is 
we need to stop TV centrism. Um, and that's a big thing for us. That's a, a huge shift in terms of how people have, you know, how we've always communicated with trips. Now we're saying outside of TV, where are we going to provide the experiences? So there's a lot of trade-offs that, that go into to these discussions. Okay, great. And I think we'll, we'll get into some of those innovations uh, shortly, yeah. but I want to take, go over to Michael. And from your perspective, I mean, what's, mm. what's the biggest change you've seen? And, and yeah, in terms of the issues I raised around connectivity and data and, and your broad footprint at Star Times, what are you seeing in the space? It's, for many, I think it's, it's exactly what Ndemi said. Uh, the question is about value or where a brand is at any given time. Um, there's less money, without a doubt, for the usual linear television because um, there's the great debate about what do we do, what do brands do on the, on the digital phase. So the, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of money moving towards the, the digital phase. In Kenya right now, for example, the big debate is, is influencer marketing really uh, efficient? And it's become a big, who are here where uh, many brands and I think Coca-Cola is one of them uh, they've had that great debate as to whether to, to use influencers in this particular region or not um, I, I fall on the not side uh, I think maybe because I have a little bit of a bias towards television I'm not sure how that's you know so then it's, it's not that I, I do want your money that is true but as much as I do want your money I think I don't know how, how, how well the influencers would do um, but again, it's all the bigger question I think most customers are having is exactly where they are, the trade-offs. So for example, if a brand is a brand looking to convert as a, to, to convert customers on the spot. So if that's what you want, then do you want television to be the place that you know that you want to, to put your money on? Or do you simply want penetration in terms of you know you want your brand to be known out there? And this is where the, again, the trade-off comes is that, do you want to put your money on the digital phase where you get penetration and you get a lot of noise, but very little conversion, or do you want television where the conversion is higher, but you know, uh, the noise is less. Uh, and, and, and this is where it is. So you'll find more and more brands are now becoming more conscious about, you know, where they want to put their, where they want to put their top dollar and what the, um, the target for each initiative that they decide to go with, it, you know, on is so what's the set KPI for every campaign that they wish to go for. But personally, the influencer thing, um, no, I don't think for for um, uh, soft drinks, for example, is there anywhere to go, guys? So give me a call. Yeah, I see, I see this um, <laughs> short messaging going on here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bullying them, Danny. I'm bullying. Uh, I'm that's bullying. good. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of, I mean, you know, all of these things, as you say, value, and the only way to see value, I mean, there's, there's obviously, there's again these, this overwhelming pre preponderance now of data and analytics. So, um, whereas before, you know, it was very simply in, in, in the old, good old days, it was, it was estimated reach, and then ROI in terms of you check your sales. And, and growth and return. These days, there's just a, a plethora of data. So how, as a, starting from you, Michael, as a, and hopefully Lanre will be able to connect with us again from an agency perspective, because I think this data is so important. And obviously you mentioned earlier about being able to give the data on audience views, but that's not as, it's not as detailed, is it? It's not as, it's not as well, I'm asking, is it as accurate? Is it as, is it as real time as the data that, an advertiser can get, say, from social media or others, you know, video platforms where it's, 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 it's literally to the minute, um, up to date data and analytics of, of who and how they're reaching people. Well, yes, and and that's that's the beauty about having this because this almost works the same way as what it works on the on, on the digital space. It, it is the difference is television measures things in terms of thirty minute intervals. And so if you want to break down television in, in third intervals, um, then, it, then the two-way system coming off a decoder is much, much more accurate. And that information, um, I think it's 10 times more accurate than you know, most of the, um, the research companies out there. Um, one of the questions and one of the great debates I think that's out there is content versus experience for, for, for many people. 
And the reason why I think the data that we produce is something is because then it, it helps you to do that. It help, um, I'll give you some of the simple, um, the, the data that we get. The first thing is, you know, a channel by channel comparison on, you know, who's, who's watching the channel at any given time, what's the most uh, best performing content at any given time. Um, we, you know, region by region, you know, broken down, is it a province, is it, you know, is it, is it women content, is it male content that's performing very well. A lot of information that is usually left up in the air. Um, but one of the other things that I think we're also looking at is how to integrate, um, you know, audience feedback in terms of they are also writing back to us and creating interactive platforms that not just, don't just tell us about the numbers, but also about the how the content is being consumed. Are they enjoying yeah, it? Maybe they yeah, yeah. Then, that's and, what I was going to ask you about. Yeah. Yes. How do you measure? How are you? What are you doing to to increase that engagement? That all the holy grail of engagement as a broadcaster. So what are your strategies there? So one of the things we've done is, and I think it's globally, I think uh, what we internally have done is we, we, we use a short code system. Um, so on the short code, and I think everybody else uses this one where we have a PRSP that, you know, get, customers are able to SMS to the station on real time and tell us what you know what they think about a show. We run scrolls during the show, tell us the person you like on the show, tell us how you like this particular show to go at any given time. So then you take that particular data and compare that against the data that's coming in of the decoder. And then you can match up now the information, the data you're getting, which is basically numbers against the emotion that you're getting, which is a psychographic about you know what, what the customers are doing. So this type of data is very, very strong. And so I think more and more customers are moving, I mean, more and more clients are moving away from a demographic analysis only. They also want, a, you know, a psychographic analysis as well, which is basically where everybody wants to go. You want to appeal to brands, you know, the heart is where you want people to be when it comes to your brand and brand engagement. No, absolutely. Hmm. Um, Danny, what's your take on, on, on this, the data and how you use it as an advertiser? Uh, I've got a couple of takes, but uh, <laughs> I think the, the biggest one uh, is, is for me, how can we use that to drive sales or how does it indicate uh, any form of sales? But, you know, to, 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 to Michael's point, you, you have all this great data that says, oh, this is how many people are watching your show. I can't really take that and translate that into anything. Neither can I take well, I can on digital because you can create some sort of click through uh, to an e-commerce site. But I think the, the big thing, and, and I was really interested in, in listening to Michael talk about it, is how now you can tie in the psychographic to a specific, um, you know, to get some sort of a motive view because that, that can, I, I think, help you build better content uh, going forward. And that, that I think, is, is, is something that first time I'm hearing about it, I'm not sure maybe somebody else at Coke has heard about it, so I don't want to say it doesn't exist. Um, but I think those are the things that we, we need more of at this point versus, again, to everybody's point, this is there's 4 million people watching this specific channel, so or this specific program, so this is the best time. That that doesn't work anymore. It, you now need, uh, you know, that sort of hot uh, how are you creating that that relationship with the consumer and that hard moment that, that Michael was talking about? And I'm, I'm not sure we've landed it from an advertising perspective yet. I think, you know, I always say we have this great data, but nobody actually knows what to do with it because it's it's so great. So what are you, you know, then you start to make, you make trade-offs you make trade -offs based on, on reach and engagement versus, uh, what were you actually trying to achieve with the content? And that's always where I think I, 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 I sort of feel there's a disconnect. So, I, you know, to hear that there's now, there are ways now that you can create or build some sort of, uh, you know, human emotion or human intellect, I don't know what the word is, it, it, it is quite interesting for, for me to hear about, and I'm sure other people. Yeah, no, great. I believe Lonre is back. Lonre, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. We're going to just connect with you on audio, I think, just because the connection isn't great. So I just wanted to ask you from an agency perspective to give us your views on, on the biggest changes in the 
in the television market space over the, the, the last few years. And we were putting it in context of obviously audience fragmentation, but also, also obviously how, um, you know, Africa's connectivity issues as you're experiencing um, impact this, you know, so, you know, traditional television still obviously is reaching tens of millions of people who don't necessarily have access to, to the, the internet data costs, etc. So how as an agency, do you see the, the current situation? What are the biggest changes? And how are you as an agency adapting to those? Okay, um, thank, thank you very much. Um, just like you said, I mean, uh, one of the biggest challenge is uh, the fragmentation that we have. And, um, and I think in addition to that is also the fact that there is a huge level of um, duplication that is happening right now. And when I speak to the duplication, it will be more from the perspective of uh, television going beyond just the box to where you now have multi devices. So I give an example. Uh, you have right now a television station is both on a terrestrial platform has a digital feed to a, a digital platform like star times the same television station is also on a live streaming platform like maybe facebook for example uh, so therefore you have like multiple devices where the where the television content and signals are available and the challenge is how do we then begin to aggregate all of the data to be able to show productivity uh, to the client, uh, wherein you probably are able to just uh, measure significantly to what is available. Uh, if I use Nigeria as an example, the kind of audience data that is available via diaries, for example, and that would only capture the terrestrial platform uh, to, to a large extent, um, the data that will be available for from um, star times will be more of uh, star times data uh, which is only you know within star times it's not to a large extent uh, one that is available to third party platforms so you know issues around um, how do you verify how do you uh, you know um, put some level of uh, validity to such data then you have uh, the challenge of how do you mine the data that is available on facebook uh, because you are not the, I mean, the advertiser do not have access to the back end. So it's very limited to what we can actually uh, be able to account for. This is one of the major, major shift that has happened of recent uh, in how television is, you know, consumed, particularly um, in terms of uh, audience viewership and also, um, and also uh issues around how do we justify and give value to clients by way of uh, uh productivity so i mean that question of, of data that's what we were looking at now and and mike was telling us about the you know the the, the psychographic versus the, the the traditional reach so i mean as an agency i mean do you see your role more and more around unpacking all of this data in terms of assisting your brands i mean you know you kind of have to be statisticians psychologists uh, to, as you said to and, and and danny said the same thing we've got all this amazing data but how do we dig into it so i mean is it is it helping us in some ways or is it actually also just are, we, are a lot of us still kind of trying to find the way to be very honest <laughs> To be honest, to be honest, Lara, um, the point is that we are all still trying to find a way around it, um, and that that's the honest truth. Because uh, what is important to the the advertiser, the, like Coca Cola, in the first instance, will be how do uh, how do we make sense of these fragmented data? That's a challenge right now. How can we effectively aggregate all of these, you know, uh, div uh, uh, disparate uh, parts? into one wholesome, uh, you know, usable data that allows for decision making. However, there is a huge opportunity also in seeing that uh, beyond just the reach and frequency, uh, the psychographic uh, opportunity in terms of seeing how engagement can be achieved. Uh, just like, for example, the kind of example that Michael, you know, cited on how we can create interaction from TV to off TV, 
um, that in itself presents itself uh, a good opportunity. Let me cite the example of what happened during COVID, uh, where everyone needs to be home and that there was a need to ensure that advertisers are visible and their content becomes very integral part of engagement. Uh, there was certain content that allows um, uh, viewers to also, you know, have uh, their videos integrated into a live programming. Uh, that creates uh, a little bit more than just uh, measuring the reach, but also allowing people to see themselves as, uh, you know, a part of part of the whole programming. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a broader sense, uh, what it means is that, you know, there's a higher level of engagement uh, beyond the fact that we can establish number of eyeballs. I think that's where we are. And I think there's going to be a lot more that has to be between the advertisers, the agency, and of course, the broadcaster. Uh, there has to be a point where there's a synergy of effort to be able to find a way to, you know, to make more sense of these new, these new shifts and developments. And in terms of, of traditional TV, how is that still playing in the mix with most of your clients? Is it still quite dominant? Um, is it, is it, are you finding it's just always got to be a combination? But where does traditional TV sit in that mix? Uh, the, the tr traditional TV is still very much in the mix. Um, um, it depends on where the brand is per time. Um, if it's a, for instance, uh, a thematic ad, uh, advertising that is uh, ad, you know, um, the focus, uh, television most of the time plays a, a much more significant role because uh, the reach for television is quite, is quite high and the level of affinity that, that we get uh, is, quite, is quite huge as well. Particularly uh, when we talk about um, brands within the fast moving consumer goods uh, category. So TV still plays a very good mix. Um, the only interesting thing that is happening right now, we don't know how fast that we that that we effectively take 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 place is the transition from uh, analog broadcasting to digital broadcasting. When when digital broadcasting is fully in place, uh, it means it will allow for more uh, greater level of investment, which I believe because uh, the the the, um, valid, the data um, would be would be more accessible to advertisers and, and and even advertising agencies across all the platforms. Yeah, you'll have even more data that you'll have to go through and analyze. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I wanted to to go back to to the rest of our panelists and speak about this, um, especially from a um, looking at the, the differences across the, the continent and the, the localization um, that's required. Um, obviously, that's always been the case. I mean, Africa is a, a vast and diverse uh, a continent. But now um, it seems to me in some ways there's a need for much more localization because of local situations and, 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 and all, all the factors that exist. But at the same time, there's also this opportunity to speak more broadly across Africa because you know, everyone's on TikTok or Twitter or Facebook, you know, so, you know, you're cutting now across, if it's more about, a, you know, an 18 to 25 demographic in Nigeria and Kenya and South Africa and, 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 and even, you know, French speaking countries are in the same places, whereas before that was really not possible. So how do you deal with these differences now? You have to be hyper-localized and at the same time, you've got these opportunities and even with, with um, some of the, you know, Star Time channels where you're now speaking, across uh, different regions. So how do you address that? Maybe we can start okay. with uh, Michael, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, go, I'll go back to the, um, the issue of localization and of, of course uh, the migration, the great migration to digital. In Kenya, we've done it. Um, I think if, if, if you're definitely not on a digital platform, you're, you're, you're living in the dark. So in Kenya, we the adaptation was there, the, the uptake was there, eighty or ninety percent, which is which is pretty big. One of the, what people don't realize is usually the GDPs in countries are not necessarily growing as much as they should, and uh, you know GDPs per capita not increasing as fast as they should. So the cake is the same, and then now we will have to, and that's what. 
um, the digital migration is done, what happens on the channels uh, in Canada is a channel called Inoro that takes care, you know, that handles the biggest um, tribe in Kenya. They currently have Kenya on, on position two. And the reason they're doing that is because of language. They've realized the, the biggest barrier to, to, you know, communication always begins with language. And... Well, Michael, we're losing small. you. Everyone has, and some people have big hands, so they grab them. Oh dear. Michael, maybe just turn okay. your video off uh, for a bit, because okay. your connection seems a bit unstable. Sorry, continue. Is that okay? Yeah, I think we can hear you better now. Okay. So, I don't know where I got lost. Uh, you were talking where, about where, the, 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 the language as the barrier. Yes. So in Kenya, for example, the, you know, I think more and more realize that the biggest uh, barrier to communication is language. And we're now getting smaller channels like uh, one called Inoro which serves the biggest tribe in Kenya. But you see, it, it, it is a tribal channel. It is one of those smaller channels, but it sits perhaps, you know, uh, maybe position two or position three on performance in, in Kenya. But again, the GDP in, in this country has not necessarily increased. So yeah, you're getting viewership numbers, but the, the K They are not willing to share this, this cake equitably. And of course, uh, you have, you know, Demni there who's sitting and he wants to, to put his money where most of the are. There are many debates about how to reach audiences. For me, one of them, one of the easiest ways to do it, uh, one of the things we started to do, uh, we looked at uh, in terms of how to reach to more audiences is we are now no longer, we're, we're, du we're still dubbing content, but we're now to adding commentary. And I don't know whether commentary as opposed to the movies having, having been dubbed. We've looked at things such as education levels in the market. The, um, if the education levels are not necessarily as high as we'd like them to be, the people who want to watch action movies, but the movies need to be dubbed. In, I mean, need to be, uh, you need to add a commentary to it so that people can enjoy it more. You, we, we're finding different ways to be able to do, you know, to be able to reach out to more audiences with the realities that are there within Africa. That's for sure. So, I'm Danny, I mean, all these choices, all these, <laughs> what does this mean for you as a brand? I mean, how do you navigate this, this hyper-localization? I think we're, we're very clear. Uh, you know, we respect, we respect, um, each of the countries and each of the languages. So what we try to do is we create content in each of the local languages that and obviously costs us more in the long run. But in terms of, I think, a respecting uh, you know, the languages, the specific, specific languages in the countries, that's, that's paramount to us. The only way that this is very strange that I use Nelson Mandela, but I think you speak to somebody in their local language and that's how you connect with them. So that's always been at the forefront for us. Um, we, we never, you know, we might create content in English, obviously, but for, for Kenya specifically, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on uh, what the key languages in Kenya are. We do the same uh, in, in, in Egypt, we do the same in Nigeria. Uh, that for us is never something that, that even comes into, into any debate. It's make sure that you localize as much as possible because that's the only way you're going to reach uh, the consumer and, and really drive the connection uh, to Michael's point, the point that's, that's required for you to solve. Yeah, we had a question that's come in. So I'm just going to share that. And then uh, whoever would like to, to answer, a question has come in that says, are you using cost per thousand in evaluating the price for airtime? And how are you calculating that? Anyone want to take a stab? <laughs> Michael or Lanre, maybe from an agency perspective? Oh, Lonry, are you still with us? Yes. Uh, did you hear the question? Did you hear the question? 
Are you using cost um, per thousand in evaluating the price for air okay. time? Um, yes, I, I, I have the question. I have the question. Yes, I do. Okay. Anyone want to specifically address it or should we move on? Do. Yes, I have. I, I can see the question. Okay. Would you, is it Hello. something you'd like? Yeah. Would Hello, you like you to? Me? Yes, we can hear you. Is it something you'd like to? Do you have an answer? All right. Perhaps you can type it in the chat and I'll communicate yes, it. Yes, I was going to say that um, it's a. Go ahead. I was going to say that it's a combination of cost per thousand and also um, the reach of uh, of the of the station or what we call the quarter hour ratings. Um, the cost per thousand allow helps to helps us to be able to 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 identify the efficiency of the quarter hour, all the uh, the available time slots where we intend to advertise. Um, so let me give an example. Um, a, a specific uh, quarter hour band on two different stations can give about the same reach, for example, but the rates will then be different. Uh, so in order to establish efficiency, we would use the rate to then uh, determine how much of efficiency do we have. And it's based on that that we, we use that. I think we're still str struggling to hear you, but I think we get the, we get the general idea. Um, anyone else have anything to add or can we... Michael, did you want to add anything? No, I think in Kenya, it's really more, you know, uh, data provided by third party. And uh, then the media houses tells what their particular rate card is. So, um, and, and, and that's usually the thing, especially when a particular, oh, heavenly father, am I still there? Yes, yes, we can Am I there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So um, we've been looking, I think here it's really, uh, there's no real formula in Kenya because of all, all I've seen is media houses determine their own rate cards. And then of course they go and determine this is what that particular rate card is going to be. And usually it is comparative. So is there a formula in this the planet? moment i wouldn't say that the most yeah. popular is the price i that i put forward okay thank you yeah no i think that makes sense i mean i think we yeah as we've all said there's there's no easy formula that's going to get you to exactly where you want to be um i'd like to speak then about some of the maybe giving us some specific innovations i mean michael the 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 the, the short codes and the and the commentary on screen obviously that's an innovation but Areas around um, thematic programming, program sponsoring, sports, um, the kind of bringing in multiple, you know, activations linked to, to television. So, you know, obviously going beyond just, you know, we've clearly gone beyond the need for just 30 second spots on TV, you know. So maybe from both of your perspectives, when it's Lonray's uh, connections better as well from an agency perspective, give us some examples of, of some innovations or some creative campaigns that have incorporated quote unquote traditional television advertising, but really taken it to the next level and, and have, have given you, especially let's start with you and Danny as a brand, um, whatever that campaign goal was, it's, it's really it's really hit it, it's nailed it. Um, <laughs> interesting one, I, I used to work on, well, I, I still work at Coke, but uh, I used to work on uh, Cathy and Minutemate and um, we were relaunching it in South Africa about two years ago. Uh, and the thing we did was around creating, um, you know, creating awareness firstly for the brand, but using the brand truth around, you know, how great juice is for you. So what we did is we put, I think it was 2,000 or 3,000 beds in um, 
in a warehouse uh, and you had literally it was the Guinness World Record of 3,000 people in a bed at the same time, uh, all drinking uh, juice. So that's how we took the experience of drinking juice uh, and, you know, the healthy nature of juice being important for you when you wake up, tying that into uh, TV to create a moment and a connection with consumers that will probably will, will last forever now because there's a world record on it. But that's that's really, you know, one of the key ones to stand out for me is how you took really an experience, which is around make sure you get down to wherever the warehouse is so you can be part of this Guinness world record. But let's use TV as a platform to communicate the benefits of, uh, you know, what, what Cappy Juice uh, provides to you. And then you sell that as one big thing. I think the, the agency and the media partners we use to come up with that uh, thought outside the box. So that, that's definitely one that stands out for me at this point. And just quickly as well, I want to, if you can address, obviously sports and sports sponsorship on TV is a, is a big part of the mix. <laughs> yeah. Is that effective? I mean, people ask about the huge amounts of money that brands spend on that. Um, you know, Spotify yeah. now just going with $300 million. And so does it, is it effective from a brand perspective? Yeah, I think. I, I definitely do. I think uh, I think it, it is effective. I think there's a, a conversation, and this is obviously my personal view. Is, is, is if you're a, if you're the if you're the sports being played, you 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 run the risk of actually being sidelined to however big the brand is. Uh, I think of uh, the Coca-Cola Cup, for instance, that now was bigger than the actual sports. So because of the experience that Coke provided. So there's always a, a trade-off, I think, from a, you know, from a, from a, uh, <laughs> well, I'm trying to find the words. I think from an advertising perspective to who the actual sports administrators are and what they're, and, and the players, of course, uh, and to the brand. So it's, it's difficult to find the synergy, I think, between what's right for the brand and what's right for the sport. Uh, but it definitely works. I think if you think of globally, if you think of um, the the Super Bowl show, that's that's Pepsi. You know, do I think people care about the Super Bowl? I, I have my personal opinions around that, but I, I know most people stick around to watch what Pepsi is doing or what Pepsi is around about to release, and and it's such a hype to to get you know advertising in in a space like that that maybe the concept of what the Super Bowl is, it gets lost. So there's, you know, I think there's a trade-off. I think it, it, it's definitely still is relevant. It's, it's, it's what your view is on it, of course. Uh, Michael, do you want to maybe share with us something on the, on the Star Times platform that's, that's, really, uh, that's really worked across various, um, especially across your various digital and uh, TV platforms? Well, yeah, um, I think from, from, from our end, just make sure that the connection is okay. Everybody can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, <laughs> clearly. All right, good. All right. So um, for us, it's really more of uh, the campaigns we've been doing are really based on strategic partnerships. And with e-commerce websites. So because one of the biggest challenges that you know most um, you know uh, advertisers have is we have to prove that there is actual conversion so one of the things that we've done the one of the things that we did is we we did partner with some of the um e-commerce platforms here in kenya so when we bought some of the sports rights what we did is we we told we gave them rights to be able to stream some of the matches that we were showing on our platform, but also on the e-commerce platform, and then offered a 30% discount on, you know, between 20 and 30% discount on anybody who was going to buy, you know, certain products during the live broadcast of those things. So that way, by the end of it, the advertiser has actual numbers in terms of sales, and it proves on the spot that, you know, is it working or not? And this is just, you know, strategic partnerships is simply going to be the way to in focus very soon, everybody is going to be watching their pockets. Uh, I like, I love the news because I, you know, it, it starts to form us as to what to do. Uh, China, we've heard there's a new strain of who knows what's happening there. And if it does come to this part of the planet, of course, 
advertisers are already watching some of those things and preparing themselves for impact. You never know what's gonna happen. So strategic partnerships becomes one of the risk mitigation ways of, you know, just making sure that uh, the way you spend your money, whether you wanna do it in advertising, um, you know, production of advertisements or whether, you know, use it for, for media buying is going to be, um, you know, a little bit more clever, a little bit more risk-free. And so that's what we're trying to do, finding more strategic partners that give direct value to the customers and immediate measure, measurables as well. So by the end of the match, have they sold 5,000 cans of Coke? Have they sold 5,000, uh, you know, cans of um, alcohol? Uh, this is just how we're doing it, to give direct value to customers and, and our advertisers as well. Right. Lanre, mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts? What, can you give us an example of something from, your, from an agency perspective that's a campaign that's been really innovative and, and that's really worked? Yeah, okay. Um, let me um, cite uh, the example of, um, um, and I think uh, Coca-Cola has, has done something, something that I've seen in this market. And I think uh, Danny made some reference to that. Um, the the Coca-Cola World Cup uh, was a very, for me, very innovative one uh, because it, it, it went beyond just just traditional advertising. Um, I mean, the, the, in itself, it kind of became like like a content on its own, you know, completely away from the World Cup as a sporting sporting fiesta. Um, and even for 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 days and months um, after the World Cup, you know, the campaign was on and it, and it provided quite a lot of engagement. I want to believe also that it will have impacted the bottom line of the brand significantly seeing how um you know um, everyone engaged with it particularly uh when you talk about the young stars uh, the young stars it wasn't just about football it was about the excitement and the engagement that comes along with with that with that old campaign um I, I don't think it was the use of television just just for the sake of television but it was about the total uh the concept around that entire advertising you know the world cup was a huge big platform you know that i believe coca-cola will have you know invested quite a lot as a global sponsor and then and then the the way the way that has, was very well integrated into into its uh, messaging and then of course television providing a very huge platform uh to reach a significant uh, court and then prevent presented a very a very very big platform so i think that's some learning that uh, you know um we, we, we all can begin to look at and see how best to begin to use television other than just, uh, you know, placing advertising, uh, which are just 30 second spot that leads, uh, that doesn't provide as much engagement uh, as we find in that, in that Coca-Cola World Cup um, example. Right. Thank you. We've just literally got a couple minutes left. So I just wanted to, to ask each of you for any final thoughts. Um, on, on where to from here. Um, if you've got any pearls of wisdom for your fellow uh, advertisers or, or broadcasters. Um, Lanre, let's stick with you. What, as an agency, what, what final thoughts would you like to just share um, as we wrap up? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I'll, I'll take it again from the my last statement, uh, which is about, it's gonna be, Every one of us working together, you know, broadcasters, advertisers, and advertising agencies, we have to look again deeply beyond the uh, data in terms of um, cost per thousand, reach, frequency, and all of that. We need to see how we can make uh, advertising on television to provide more engagement than just eyeballs. Um, eyeballs are good, and if you check today, uh, the the instance that I cited where you now have television on multiple platforms beyond just the box. Uh, so there's a lot of passive viewing that is happening right now. I mean, we are having this virtual uh, seminar, you know, and the truth of the matter is this. I know in between people might be doing one or two other things at the same time. Uh, yeah. The world we are today has, has brought us to a more high level multitasking space. So how yeah. do we ensure that we get engagement beyond just eyeballs for me will become the kind of thing that we are 
to sit down mm -hmm. and to begin to think about how, how that can happen. It's not going to be just by the agency or the broadcaster or the client asking the question. It's going to be uh, us working together, in, you know, collaborating, probably having to spend some quality time to figure out how do we get engagement uh, in, in particularly, you know, where we have to do traditional TV advertising or even digital advertising. Thank you. We're going to be running out of time, I think, in just a minute. Um, any very quick closing thoughts from uh, Michael or Mdeni in the, in the closing minute that we have? Okay. And then me, call me. And then, okay, so let's see. Um, it's simple. I know it's a, it's a dumb one, but the, but the conversation really needs to be content versus experience. What do you want your brand to be? If you want, while content is key, I still say nowadays content is not king. Content is key. Experience is another key factor in how brands do this. So it's not just one thing. Let's let's think about how we can be able to get both great content and great experiences with our brands. Thank you. I've been told I have to wrap up. And Danny, two two no, two I sentences. Think, I think that sums it up well. It's uh, okay, content, great. experiences, and collaboration. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank Sorry I had to so cut much. you off. On, we're okay. running out of time. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your next Thank panel. You. Everyone. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye.